We did it. Our parlay finally hit. We almost canceled the entire show. Run It Back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up, run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah, yeah. Good Tuesday morning. Welcome to Run It Back. We are coming to you live from various parts. Uh, well, <laughs> almost this great nation because Chandler's in Cabo. I swear, Chan, you're living our lives. Love it so much. Sean Sharani, as always, Stadium Insider and Eddie G on the end. So if we lose Chandler at any given moment, so be it. That's just the way it is, right? <laughs> it's just yeah. like, I'm, I'm, like I'm, afraid. I'm afraid to go. Apologize in advance. Don't apologize. You're living the lives we wish we had. All right, we got to get things started. Um, some good games, some weird games. How about this one, though? Nets beating the Cavs. Their ninth straight win. KD Kyrie each with 32. Darius Garland, though, 46 and a loss. We will talk about that in a second. And, Eddie, we will get to you, obviously. But, Chandler, we talked a little bit Eastern Conference yesterday. Do you have the, uh, the gumption to now put the Nets on the same level as Boston, Milwaukee, and Philly? Yeah, listen, they're the real deal. I mean, they've won, they're 15 and two in their last 17 games. And and it's all pretty much around Kevin Durant. He's become this MVP candidate. He's dominating. Uh, and it just feels like the, the drama of the Nets is kind of somewhat behind them. And, and these guys are just getting better every single game. Uh, even last night, they're missing Curry and Harris and, and they're just getting, they're getting a lot from everybody. And, and it starts with Durant. I hate to put it on Nash because, you know, who knows if it was his fault or not, but that's the type of move that I think gave this team closure. It made, you know, guys in the locker room happy. All the Ben Simmons, you know, drama, I feel like, and all the noise is kind of limited now. Um, and these guys are just going out there and they're hooping and, and they're super talented. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, they are, they are, a, you know, they're right there. I, I don't think they're as good as a team as Milwaukee and Boston, but yeah, I'd love to see a series, uh, you know, with them there. Yeah, I think this is for the first time in like four years throughout this Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant era where it's literally been just basketball. They've been locked in for the last month or so. And fault me because it might be too soon, but when I watch this team play, it reminds me a lot of the Celtics from last year. When you think about th that team went through similar drama in the offseason. Danny Ainge steps down. Brad Stevens steps down. Uh, they, they had a lot of questions about the roster and the fit. They were below 500 around Christmas. They, were, uh, they got to above 500 in January. There were a lot of questions around that organization. They, just like the Nets, went on a nine-game winning streak in February, turned their season around against some bad teams, but picked up a lot of momentum. Um, and that Celtics team had one of the best uh, offensive ratings in the league. The Nets in December have had the best offensive rating in the league. So to me, this is a team that's picked up a lot of momentum against bad teams, taking advantage. These are games that they were losing a year ago. So to be taking care of business, that's really what makes you a, a, a really dominant uh, team. And I think town has never been the issue. So give Jock Vaughn a lot of credit we know about what KD and, and Kyrie Irving bring to the table, but I think when you look at this team, Utah, Watanabe, uh, you think about TJ Warren, Ben Simmons is playing his role, Nick Claxton. Th this is a team that's gaining a lot of confidence, a lot of momentum at a great time as we reach the midway point of the season. I know. I know Eddie wants to talk. Go ahead, Eddie. Go ahead. What, what do you want to talk? By the way, call, the cynic in me always cringes a little bit when we're like, the drama's behind them. It's just because I just feel like, oh, God, it's something going to be Michelle. around the you corner. Never know. I know. It's, it, that, it, that's the part that always gets me like, ah. But but seriously, Eddie, it's, I know I know you're biased, but that's OK. That's that's part of being an awesome fan. How, what is the ceiling here, really? Uh they're a championship contender. They, we always knew they were. And I'm just going to say the quiet part out loud because, <laughs> yes, Jacques Vaughn has been amazing. Yes, Kevin Durant has been amazing. Yes, Ben Simmons has continued to make strides. But the Nets are better because Kyrie Irving looks like Kyrie Irving again. And with his eight-game sabbatical for various reasons, we've talked about it a ton, he's gotten his legs back. He's gotten back to looking like him. He carried in the fourth quarter yesterday. It's, he's done that several times over their, win, over their winning streak as – teams start to double Kevin late in games and trap him a little more. It opens up the floor for Kyrie and he looks amazing. He looks like a top 20 player. He looks like the Kyrie Irving we've all come to know and love on the court and it's absolutely transformed the, the team. Last night Ben was great defensively. He struggled a little bit offensively. Zach Vaughn was trying to figure out where to play him in the fourth quarter as, as, as the Cavs defense played off of him. 
And uh, it was Kyrie who picked up the slack when Kevin fouled out about three minutes to go. He's been amazing, and he's made them a true contender uh, with his advancements this year. What I always wonder, and what I told Kevin the other day before they left, I knew, I need to see them beat the Celtics. I have to mm. see them beat that team. They've lost, I believe, seven straight to them, including the playoffs. Oof. A lot of close games, but they continue to lose to them. The size the Celtics have, the physicality, it bothers them. But the Milwaukee, uh, the Milwaukee game and the Cavs game, those are good matchups for the for the Nets. And so I thought they would win those games, it, w- w- whether it's a blasphemous or bias or not. I thought they would win those games because they just have nothing for Kyrie Irving and they have nothing for Kevin Durant, but the Celtics do. And that's the team I need to see them beat. They play them again in a couple weeks in Barclays and I'm waiting for that game. Hmm. That's the obstacle. What do you think Chandler, as far as the expectations on this Nets team is, is, is it Boston's ahead of them and there's no way around that? Or is there something that they could do to get past that and make it all way? I mean, look, I think the expectation is to win a championship. I think, like I said, all, all the drama should be in the rearview mirror now, and, and they need to move forward. And they have so much talent. They have guys like TJ Warren now that are getting his legs back. They have a lot of shooting. Uh, Kyrie Irving is doing his thing. This is a team that has so, so many skilled players and so many ways to beat you that, yeah, I, I think that if they're clicking, they're healthy, they can beat anybody in the series. So I think the expectation is to, is to compete for a championship, but they obviously know that East is, is stacked at the top. Okay. Well, I hope for Eddie's sake, all of this pans out. Look, we, we, ha- we can't just skip past the fact that Darius Garland had 46 points. I know it was a loss, but 46 is still pretty impressive. And this is a Cavs squad that we all, the nation spoke very highly of just a couple weeks ago. Are you still high on this team, Eddie? Do you still think that there's a lot of potential here or where would you put them at the moment? Yeah, I'm high on them. I think they could win a playoff series or two. I, I, I think there's obvious deficiencies with just how small their front court is or the back court is and, and, and the defense that they're going to struggle to play at that position. Uh, and we saw that last night. We, we, we saw the, the, the Nets being able to get off the point of attack over and over and over because at the end of the day, Darius Garland is just a smaller guard. Donovan Mitchell is just a smaller guard, and it is what it is. They also haven't figured out their their small forward position. Uh, so, yeah, they have some deficiencies. I think they also have room to make improvements in the trade market or even in the buyout market. Uh, but I, I do think they're just a tier below those true contenders out east. When you talk about the Bucks, you talk about the Celtics, and I, I guess you talk about the Nets, too, and Philly. Uh, <laughs> but they get the right matchup, and and, and they, can, they can shake some stuff out there. I just think they're not going to be favored against either one of those guys out there. Yeah, I will say they're yeah, just not I, as I think the they, teams- don't, they don't have as much star power. Mm. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I, I think the teams that Eddie mentioned are totally on point. Like I, I view those teams as, as kind of that next level. And, and Cleveland, I think they have a lot of work to do, even internally. When you think about the the, the Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, it's a great backcourt. I think we've all been praising them. But you saw last night Donovan Mitchell struggled. I think he was the focal point of the offense. And then you saw Darius Garland kind of look at it and, and was like, listen, I got to pick up the slack. And then he goes off. How do they figure out the dynamic of playing well off of each other? Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious how that, how that transforms. Yeah, Chandler, how does that transform? <laughs> I'm not going to pick on the spot. I'm afraid we're going to lose you. Okay, I, I, we have to talk about the Clippers game. Um, it was a, an emotional roller coaster for Steve Ballmer and anybody who roots for the Clippers. It's also a bizarro world because there's a stat here. So they go on a 13-1 run. They send this thing into overtime, and they end, eventually win. PG has 32-11. and 11. But here's the stat. NBA teams were two and 12,873 when losing by 14 with three minutes remaining. I had to read that like seven times and I'll also double check it. Um, this is a crazy comeback win. Got to feel for Pistons and their fans, but Chandler, have you ever been on either side of a comeback like this? I mean, not quite like this. This this is pretty shocking, and obviously the Pistons are are in the the Wimby sweepstakes here, and, and I'm, I'm you know they battled at home, but you, you can't imagine this was on purpose. And uh, <laughs> no, I've never Ooh. seen, I've never been a. I think we lost Chandler, Eddie. What do you think? Have you have have you seen a comeback like this, or or a seesaw of this dramatic Ooh. way? <laughs> Good lord. Uh, 
the one I could think of is that Rock, Rockets Clippers game uh, in the middle of the three one comeback and just the 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 Lob City Clippers just absolutely collapsing. So it's kind of funny that yeah. they're the ones on who, who are on the other side of it this time. I love that we won our parlay on this because it was a dramatic night. Uh, I mean. it, it just goes to show the power of the three point ball in today's game. It's you never feel like a nine point lead is what a nine point lead used to be. Uh, now, now 13 should be a little bit better. 14 should be a little bit better, but I mean, if, if one team's trying to lose and one team's trying to win, anything can happen, I guess. I mean, that is, that is a dramatic, epic. go ahead, Shams. Yeah. The most epic comeback for me was, I mean, it's the Clippers against Memphis. I think it was in <laughs> Memphis. I don't know if you guys remember. It was like swaggy. P was going crazy, making yes. threes. Like that was my most favorite comeback of all time for sure. But this one just, I also feel for the Pistons. I look, if this is all part of the tank, then it's very, very dramatic. Um, and thank you for our parlay, by the way. But as far <laughs> as, it, you know, the Clippers and where they sit in the West, I know everyone considers them one of the deepest, if not the deepest team in the league, but we still haven't really gotten to see them play as a whole all that much. Um, they're fourth in the West, though, considering. Chandler, as far as where they're going to finish or if they're as good as Nuggets, Pelicans, and Grizzlies, do you agree with that? Yeah, listen, they're a very good team. They're solid, and I think the healthier Kawhi Leonard gets, the better they are. But they're kind of like the the Western Conference Cavs. Like, they are very good. I like their team, but I just, you know, three or four or five of these other teams have kind of made that push to, to kind of go ahead of them and by eyes. And I think that, they, they, again, they'll win a series, maybe even two series. And, and they're so deep. Even last night looking at their game, you know, they have so many guys that can score the ball. They have so many guys that can switch and defend and uh, – Kawhi Leonard has got to, you know, continue to build and get his legs back. But this is a great team. I just feel like, you know, the Nuggets, the Pels, the Grizzlies, the Suns are are all uh, a lot more dangerous at this point. Yeah, their depth is it, what's going to carry them. And they played 11 players last night legitimately. <laughs> and all every one of them scored. And that's without Kawhi Leonard. So that, that just shows how many NBA players they have. I mean, I, sometimes we joke watching the games, watch the Lakers and say, how many NBA players on this team, but the Clippers have that many NBA players. Uh, but I, I wonder about the matchups a little bit with them, with all their size they have on the perimeter. It's going to bother most teams. Uh, the team I actually worry about them a lot with is the Warriors and all the stuff they do off ball and all the running around Steph Curry is going to do. But outside <laughs> of that, like they're, they're a tough matchup for everybody out West, uh, not to be John Morant, but I think they're good out there. Uh, in the East, it gets a little bit different. You, you have the Celtics, you have Giannis as well, who I, th I think will continue to give them issues. But yeah, this is a tough team. It's going to be a wild card all year long until we know Kawhi Leonard can play three months of basketball in a row. And we don't know that. And I don't think we will know that until he actually does it. And that's just always going to be the question mark for them. And there's no way around it. Yeah. I mean, look, he's played 13 games out of the 35 Shams. I, I don't, I don't worry about Kawhi Leonard as far as the switch that he has to turn things on and off, but what about the rest of the team? Like one day you're a guy who's got significant minutes and points and the next day you're, you're gone um, because Kawhi's back in the lineup. Like, do we have any concerns as far as how that sort of chemistry play by play is going to, is going to pan out? Yeah, I think that's really the concern for the, that's been the concern for the Clippers all, all year, which is that you have all these guys in and out of the lineup. How does that impact you? And, what we've seen is Ty Lue give him a lot of credit. This team has been treading water. They're a team that's a shoo-in for the playoff berth. They're not really fighting right now, at least at least as of now, for a play-in. Like, that's a blessing for this team to, to have because of all the injuries they've went through with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. They've got the worst plus-minus of any team in the top six at plus .2 because they're just literally tr just trying to get by. And I think the more wins they stack up, uh, the more momentum they get, and I think getting Kawhi Leonard to the point in the second half of the season where he might not be missing back-to-backs and he's going to stay healthy because as long as he's back on the floor and they manage him the right way, I think we all know that Kawhi Leonard is most, most lethal in the playoffs. He's most lethal uh, when it matters most. Um, I think Joel Embiid last week called Kawhi Leonard the Michael Jordan in the playoffs. So uh, <laughs> we know what he brings to the table is just getting to that point. And, we, and, and look, Ty Lue does a pretty good job of masking, I'm sure, what has to be internal frustration. When asked about how many games it would take to really get a, a gauge, he just spit out 15. I mean, it's crazy to think that we may not get to see all of that. 
I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, Eddie, like how the other teammates must feel as far as Kawhi and the way this whole thing gets played out, how the Toronto Raptors must have felt the way that all played out as far as like what is deemed important regular season versus post. Um, but hey, if it works, it works, right? Who am I to say? I can, I can <laughs> feel your Spurs ties <laughs> tingling right now. I, 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 I actually like... think it's I actually think it's a situation where everybody kind of knows what they're getting into. And, yeah. and maybe you don't like it, but you understand it. And I bet they're looking at it a lot like Shams does. If we can get them back right by April, it doesn't matter because we can absolutely win 16 playoff games with this guy. We've seen him do it. We know yep. he can do it. And so I'd imagine it's, a, it's, it's, they're just accepting of it. And yeah, it's frustrating on a day to day, but you know, if I'm Norman Powell, uh, I get to play 30 minutes because Kawhi is out and I get to take all the shots <laughs> I want. It's not so True. bad. It's not so bad. Um, as long as he's there when we need him most. And uh, I think he will be. I think he will be. Yeah, I, I think he will be as well, which is which is scary for everyone else. This is uh this is the part of the show where Eddie gets to shine. We're gonna talk a little T Wolves. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it up on a T and I'm gonna let you take it away, Eddie. All right. So after a, a timeout, there's just favorite a, topic. It's just, it's just brutal. They lose to the Heat. It's their Heat are eleven and six and games decided by five or fewer points. But this was after a called timeout, and they just I mean, what happens here, Eddie? They butcher it. What what's the problem? It's it's okay. So <laughs> we'll see the play in a second here, but uh, the, everybody falls down, but it actually benefits them because Nazri, who's actually second in three point percentage on their team, a very underrated and unheralded player in the league, he's wide open over there. And my guy doesn't even see him, doesn't even think to look at him. I, I know JV was running the play and I get it, but man, if, if you see him, you get an open shot. It sucks these guys didn't even get a catch or a shot. They had time too, two and a half seconds. Uh, before this, also oh. Anthony Edwards missed the free throw that could have cut the lead to two. Uh, they had every opportunity to win this game. It hurts. Uh, little, little quiet note. You notice that uh, Rudy Gobert, the hundred yeah, whatever happened? million dollar man, he's not on the court right there. Uh, oh. I don't think he should have been either. Down three, but not on the court. Just wonder if there's going to be some strife there. It, it's been a rough season for them, and they have no picks ever after this, thanks to Rudy Gobert. So yeah, they need to turn it around soon. Uh, can they? Yeah, li- can they turn around? <clears throat> Listen, if, if Nas Reed keeps playing this way, uh, I, I think they'll be somewhat okay. But yeah, this this was just brutal. This is a horrific way to lose a game. Uh, uh, again, the Rudy Gobert trade just a nights like this just keeps getting exposed and exposed. And I know Eddie loves it, but uh, this is uh, this is this is a this is a this is a bad bad loss. This one's ugly. This one was ugly. By the way, no Jimmy Butler, no Bam Adebayo. The team is still 500. They're sitting ninth right now in the East. It's a team that I think has confused a lot of people, Chandler. And, and as far as this Miami Heat squad, do you expect anything out of them as the season goes on? Uh, I don't. I think they're a solid team. I think they're a dangerous matchup if they get in the playoffs. Um, you know, they have the experience. They have the talent. They have the shooting. Uh, but no, I think the East kind of these teams we discussed earlier in the show have kind of made that leap and, uh, they're not really a contender and they kind of been up and down. They, they're the one team that didn't really make a trade. They didn't really make a move. They put hero in the starting lineup and that kind of thinned their bench out a little bit. So, uh, Lowry has been struggling. Uh, I don't see it from them. I wouldn't want to play them in the first round, but I don't think they're really a contender at, at this point in the season though. Uh, I'm going to throw out. A stat here, significance, and I want to see how big a deal it is to any of you guys. Duncan Robinson became the fastest player to hit 800 career threes last night. Eddie, how big a deal is that? Not that big a deal to me. There's another like really random player who keeps doing this too. It's just the way of the league now, and and somebody has to be the guy. By no means are you saying he's going to break Steph Curry's record or even get close to it. Uh, I think it's nice that he's doing this and it's cool. And he has a great uh, role in this league right now, but this is also a guy that his, his team decided can, he cannot play in the playoffs. Uh, his team <laughs> decided maybe we need to trade him at every opportunity we can. Um, and as soon as he signed his contract was immediately overpaid. So, you know, shout out to Duncan for being a sniper. I love that for him, <laughs> but that's just the league now. And this, this will probably be broken soon. It's just because how the, everybody's playing. It's crazy. Yeah, listen, this guy, got, this guy got 
he got yeah. ninety million dollars off off doing this, and you know he's kind of been in and out of the rotation. But the kid can sh- basically this just means he can shoot. He is a sniper, and it's pretty much all <laughs> he does. He comes in there, he comes off handoffs, he comes off screens. He can really shoot. It's a cool record. I would, I, it's probably not even a big deal to him, though, to be honest with you. But it's cool to say that you got that in the bag, though. Right? I mean, it's cool to see that list, and it's just your name all the way down it, basically, minus marketing. I think that's kind of cool. I don't know what you do with that. Yeah, it's if super you, cool. You put it in the wall in your house or something, maybe. I have no idea, but it, it, it looks <laughs> cool-ish. Um, <laughs> can we talk some Damian Lillard? I'm fascinated by the Damian Lillard story, and I will continue to be as long as it plays out, because who knows how it will ultimately play out. But right now, he is known as a man who is loyal. He's also now technically known as the greatest blazer, uh, surpassing Clyde Drexler on the scoring record. Um, They did beat the Hornets 124-130, but he was honored after the game. That's what we're looking at right now. And it's been a big deal because he's made much of staying in Portland, uh, and it looks like he plans to do so. But some people will say why. And Chandler, I ask you this. Will it end up helping or hurting his all-time legacy staying in Portland? I think it helps when you look across the league and guys like Dirk and Kobe, these guys that Tim Duncan that have stayed with one team, it just shows a lot about the, you know, their character and how much they've done for that organization, how much they've done for that community. And he's made Portland a home and uh, I'm super happy for him that he's now the all time leading scorer. And he's going to go down as the greatest Portland trailblazer of all time. So that, that has a lot of impact and maybe he, had, he missed out on some opportunities in a bigger market or, you know, it doesn't look like he's probably going to win a championship in the next couple of years in Portland. So I don't know if that factors in, but I think it's awesome and it's super impressive because not a lot of guys can do this. Not a lot of guys have the longevity and uh, you know, shout out to Dane because that's, that's extremely impressive and hard to do. Yeah, I'm with Chandler. I, I think this is dope. I know we judge everybody on like the Jordan standard and, and, and this is rings <laughs> culture and it's frustrating that he hasn't won a title. And that's true. And Dame wants to win a title, but he's had great playoff successes. He's he's carried this franchise on his back for over a decade. And this is a, you know, this is an iconic franchise in a lot of ways. This is a historic franchise. And to be the, the far and away best player that's ever put on that jersey and the most prolific, that matters. So let me, like... Again, you'd love to win a title, but Dan will be going back to Portland until he's 80 and they'll be celebrating him every <laughs> time he goes. And and that's that's what you play the game for. That's the stuff you care about. So, um, you know, I know this is the participation trophy era and all that stuff, but this is worthy of this celebration. He deserves this. And I, I think it's dope that he stayed. I hope he does. But even if he leaves later in his career to right. try to get a ring, I don't think it diminishes anything that he's done out there in Portland. Uh, he'll get his statue out there, and 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 he'll be lo- he'll be royalty for as long as he co- continues to go to Portland, and I love that for him. Yeah, Dame's a real one, and like for me, I, I just view his playoff successes like Eddie said. I don't think he, I mean he hasn't made it to the NBA Finals, made, he's made it to the Conference Finals, but some of the shots he's made, uh, the one against Paul George and OKC, like these are moments that we're, we're always going to remember. And I think with Dame Lillard, he's had multiple chances to leave that organization to ask out uh, formally. He's thought about it. He came very close to requesting a trade a couple off seasons ago. He decided to play it out, let Portland uh, have a chance to, to, to figure it out and, and, and revitalize the roster around him. Right now they have a group that I think can contend for something in the Western Conference. I don't know if it's a, if it's a championship, but they can get by maybe in a round or so and, and just see where it goes from there. But for Dame Lillard, obviously it's, it, obviously it's, it's become even more than just uh, wins and losses in Portland, and, and this is a legacy thing for him. Those Portland Trailblazers, when I was 15 – made me cry all the time. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a team that means a lot to a lot of us as far as NBA fans are concerned. Take it a quick break. When we come back, the latest on Tyrese Maxey. Cannot wait to hear from Shams on that. And would Sidney Dean have won multiple MVPs? Obvs when Run It Back comes back. And there was the tweet that raised some eyebrows. Uh, Demonis Sabonis suffering a fractured ligament in his right thumb. He will attempt to play through the injury listed as questionable uh, against Denver tonight. Of course, I'm like, ooh, that sounds really tough, Shams, playing through injury. What what can you tell us about that injury and what it means? So it's an avulsion fracture of the ligament in his thumb. And basically, from what I'm told, he 
uh, essentially the ligament in that thumb, it fractured off the bone in his hand. And, and tonight he's listed a question, well, he's trying to play through this as opposed to getting surgery. Um, uh, it's a, definitely a very uh, difficult injury to play on and play with. I think there definitely is, is potentially going to be some brace involved here that he's going to have to use to play with. It wouldn't surprise me if he ends up missing at least a game or two or three to make sure that he can get fully comfortable before getting on the court. I know, Chandler, you've dealt with a lot of injuries in your time. Uh, what's been your experience with thumb injuries and also this particular one as far as what, what you've dealt with in your past? Yeah, the thumb is tough, right? Because every single play, your thumb is involved. You're dribbling with both hands. You're passing, catching the ball. Um, at least this is not his shooting hand. But still, as a big, this is going to be something, again, kind of like the Steph Curry shoulder that's going to linger. I didn't know you could fracture a ligament. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> uh, so I'm not like, sure medically what that is. But... Yeah, I, I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of brace or a bunch of tape on his hand. I'm sure he's going to do injections. I'm sure he's going to do anything he can to kind of get through this. But uh, I've, like I said, I've never seen that. And it sounds like it's going to like need surgery. But, you know, shout out to him for playing through this. He's, he's a tough dude and, and the Kings obviously need him. But uh, the thumb is no joke in every single play. This is going to kind of, you could re-agitate it. He could hurt it. So th this is, this is a dicey situation for him. Guys, just... if I fracture a ligament, whatever that means, I won't be on zoom. I will not <laughs> count me yes, out. You I don't will. know how he's about to play basketball like this. Uh, shout out to baby bonus. They need him right now though. They're in the playoff hunt. And that team needs to break their playoff curse. So I hope he's able to work through it and make it work. Uh, he can. Even if with the off shooting hand, like God bless him for doing that. But you know how that goes. You drive, you get whacked on that hand one time. It might end your week. I, I'm, he's better I'm telling than you, <laughs> I've been playing with this wonky finger since Thanksgiving and it won't heal. And it hurts anytime I touch anything and I'm not playing basketball. So I have no idea how badly that's going to hurt. Um, but he's a tough dude, tough dude. Tough, 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 tough. I hope. I don't know. We say that. Um, good news on the other front, I think, right? Tyrese Maxey for Sixers fans, Shams, you've got something positive to tell us. We haven't seen Tyrese Maxey since November 18th. He, he <laughs> suffered that small fracture in his foot. He, it was only thought of to be three to four weeks. Uh, it's been well over that now, but I'm told he's going to return this weekend, likely on Friday in New Orleans against the Pelicans. Uh, they also play on Saturday against OKC, so if he's not ready by Friday, it'll be Saturday. But he will be back in a few days here. This is 23 points per game, uh, back to their lineup, over 40%, three-point percentage. This is a guy that could, you, know, you could argue is their second best offensive player from a pure scoring standpoint. Um, it'll be curious to see how he comes, uh, whether he comes off the bench, is he going to start? How does Doc Rivers use him when he comes back into the lineup? I think it is in play that he could come off the bench, uh, but he will also be on a minutes restriction when he makes his return. This is huge news. Um, I feel like we should do a side-side parlay because I think he comes back Saturday against Oklahoma City. It just seems like an easier comeback. But, Eddie, uh, what are you expecting? I don't know if playing against Shea Gilders Alexander is an easier comeback. That's but fair. I, fair I'm expecting point. scoring punch, especially initially off the bench, as it sounds like he might be uh, his role in uh, coming back. But – they need his speed. They they need that scoring punch he provides, and, and they're going to welcome it. He, he, he's a better player than the Anthony Melton, who has stepped in and played really well. So if we're getting supercharged Melton in that role, then they're, <laughs> they're going to be a better team. They're, they're welcoming their best player back. They are one of the contenders out east, and they need to see what this element looks like with the role they're on as of right now, with James being a true facilitator, like just really focusing on that and scoring whenever need be. Uh, th this is going to be great for them. And he's got time to get ready and to get back into shape. And you always worry a little bit with a foot injury, with a foot fracture on top of that. You, you need your feet for basketball, That's but true. I think he'll be fine. And I think he'll be, uh, he'll be transformative for them. He'll, he'll help them a ton. Not a doctor, but you did know that you need your feet for basketball. And that's the kind of insight that you're going to want to keep coming back for. Matter of fact, we're going to take a break now. Uh, and when we come back, who knows? We're going to do something. And maybe Chandler will join us from Cabo. Maybe he won't. The Wi-Fi gods have it in their hands. <laughs> be back. <laughs>
Welcome back to Run It Back. Chandler Parsons um, has left the building <laughs> officially. I don't think he's getting back on, but hopefully we'll have him back tomorrow uh, with, with a really good Wi-Fi. But this is the Eddie Gonzalez hot seat edition of Convince Me because <laughs> all the pressure is going to be on you and Shams and I are just going to attack. So here we go. First up, convince me, convince us um, that cameras should be placed in select players' jerseys so we can have a little POV. Eddie, go. You know, every once in a while, we get like the referee camera or the pylon cam. We mm. need as many views as we can get of the court. I think it would be amazing. I told you, I'm a big advocate for miking everybody up and just giving us the edited feed. Not yep. like the Christmas day. Everybody knows their mic. They're hamming it up for the camera. I mean, like, I'm cussing the ref out, questioning <laughs> their manhood. That mic'd up. The same thing with with the with the cameras. Let's see as much access to the sword as we can. It can only help. I don't care if there's foul <laughs> language. It can only help. Let Let's do it. I like this idea. I wonder what the what the feed would look like though on that camera. Oh, uh, well, considering how Chandler's look today, I'm gonna say thirty <laughs> percent. <laughs> Might be a bad. I don't look. know shops. I feel like the CBA would be. I'm gonna trust the NBA's cameras more than the Cabo cameras. <laughs> Personally, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the NBA cameras. I think their Wi-Fi is gonna be better. Oh, I would love it yeah. though. I love it. like some sort of headband, like weird GoPro. Okay, uh, Eddie, this one, <laughs> I think everyone agrees. Convince us that if a player complains about a call, automatic T. Go. What? Why is this a thing? Yes. No, no way. Yes, I, this yes, is, please. This is some of my favorite parts of the sport. Could you imagine how short the game would oh, be if it's just like so foul, short. right back to it? We'd literally be watching fifty-two minute basketball games. Fine. Uh, I think that I think the league sponsors would not like that. They they need to do those <laughs> long commercial breaks so we can see all our complaining. Uh, yeah, uh, I like that Luca is the pitcher of every one of these stuff. It's like, amazing. He's earned this. He's earned this reputation. This is perfect for how is Kevin leading the league in text and not Luca? I, right? I just what are we doing? What are we doing? Or Draymond but, for that matter. He gets them now just from the bench. Like that's his new Draymond, thing. Draymond Draymond is <laughs> Dray really rides the refs. <laughs> right? <laughs> Like that would be fun, I think. If an automatic technical, it's I, well, you'd you'd end up with like three players per team per game, almost nightly, just because every single time it'd be. I I don't know. Let's try it. Why don't we try one night docket of games with this rule and see how it plays? I out. like the football. I like the football rules better. Like you can pretty much do everything but tackle a referee in football, and it's like yeah, yeah. like whatever. Next play, let's just do that. That's better. <laughs> I don't know. I These games like would be one. long, but they they would have to get rid of ejections, right? Like, there's no such thing as ejections if you can give out a technical foul off every single reaction to oh, the no. referee. Like, so there's no, no technical ejecting. fouls. Players pick up like ten texts in a game. Oh, I might God. be down for that, honestly. Summer I'm league saying, rules. I, I like fun. it. I like it too. Like I'm it. all in. Okay, <laughs> this one is uh, this is the every year argument. How do we make it better? Eddie, convince us that the dunk contest participants would be voted on by fans. And unless you're hurt, you have to go. Ah, do you trust the fans though? Like, sure, we I'm might a fan. end up with like, you know, Rudy Gobert in the dunk contest. <laughs> Just people want to troll. There we go. Like, uh, I, I do like the letting the fans pick. I do like putting the onus on the players to really, to really lock in and do this. So yeah, I'll say it. We, we get a dud every couple of years. Cool. But we'll get to watch yeah. John Morant and Zion Williamson try to do a front flip and dunk or something. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's do this. I, like take the fan vote out of the all-star game, put it into the Saturday night stuff. I think that's actually way better than the system we have now. Uh, I agree. So I'm for it. I actually agree with that Shams because the game itself will be fine. It's the still, it's the skills Saturday that tends to suffer. I think from year to year, so many years you're just like, this was absolute garbage. And I don't know why I wasted any of my time watching it. So I'm actually okay with that. It's idea, just right? the ebbs and flows, though. Like they're not able to get those highlight nights, right? Like the Zach Levine, Aaron Gordon dunk yeah. contest that we had several years ago. Like we're not able to revitalize that. But I don't know. I, I actually like this idea. So you know, I don't. See? I don't know if we got the pull, Michelle. You might have to make this happen. I, I don't have the pull. You have the pull. So <laughs> get on the phone and call Adam and do whatever it is that you need to do. Make this happen because I do. Run think it back. Be we'll do it. Um, yeah. Let's let's fix Whoa. things. Okay. Eddie, this one's serious. Convince okay. us that players can be ruled out due to load management, but only three times a season. 
I like this. I like putting a cap on kind of mm-hmm. doing this. But look, who are we to say these guys aren't injured and aren't hurting? And and cool. <laughs> somebody like Kawhi and the things he's dealing with with his knee and and it, teams are going to do their due diligence. They want those guys out there. They want to win. But I do like doing this. And then you got to be a little more strategic, and you also get to be a little more disrespectful when you say. All right, we'll sit in Kawhi against the Pistons, but not right. the Lakers or whomever else. Um, maybe not three. Three is a little low. Let's say five. But I like five. having a cap on this. I don't mind that either. I don't. I don't know, Shams, if there would ever be a way. Obviously, because now you're you're taking medical into it. But it sure would be nice if there was some sort of a cap, right? So that you knew that. And and this goes for the stars thing and fans and all all of it. It would fix a few problems. There's just no way the toothpaste out of the tube. I don't know how you do it. Yeah, I, I think I think this is a tough one because we saw what the Nets did a, a, a few weeks ago when they got fined 25K <laughs> in Indy. They listed like eight players out with various different ailments. And um, I guess the league deemed that they were all load management or load managing because they they all, you know, they basically, basically <laughs> call a cap and gave them a fine. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think teams will always find a way around it. Um, you know, you're always able to come up with something if, if, if you need to. Yeah, that's it's true. We say whatever we want. All right, Eddie, convince us that had he played in the league, Sidney Dean from White Men Can't Jump would have won multiple MVPs. So if you remember, he he, he had Michael Jordan out there on Venice Beach, guarded him, <laughs> went against him, took him to the hole, Billy, and gave him buckets. And Mike told him, pull up. He wanted him to play in Chicago. He wanted him bad on his team. So I think Sydney was that nice. Had the handles, had the shot, was dunking on guys left and right. He even made his teammates Phew. better. It took him eight tournaments and like a year and gambling debts and a whole bunch of drama. But he even made uh, Billy Hole better. So I'm going to say, yeah, multiple MVPs. I, I see that for Sydney Dean. But he was just Please. in love with that street ball. I, he, he was true to the game. <laughs> Bro. Wesley Snipes is listed on the interweb at 5'9", which means 5'7". Okay? No way. Took him to the hole. No chance. Took him to the- you no, hear the stories no, about no them, them filming that movie. Like, Wesley Snipes could not play basketball at all when he showed up. That's why he looks so crazy in that movie. It's so good. But he's an athletic guy. But I do he love that hat. It's like the Karch Karai old school, like, beach volleyball cool hat. I kind of love it. Now I kind of want to watch that movie again. Yeah. It's pretty good. I, I like how every year for Halloween, uh, a white guy... Uh, shows up as Billy and one of his teammates shows up as Wesley Snipes. I remember Russ and Nick Collison did it. And it's been like every year ever since. I, I, that's I like iconic. That, that, that's a trend. We need that trend. Could you make a movie today called White Men Can't Jump? I don't know. I don't know. That's no, the million dollar question. Not. I don't know what we're allowed to do not. anymore. Um, all right. So guys, the, we know about the Dirk Nowitzki, sta- Nowitzki statue because it's amazing. And we talked about it a little bit yesterday. Uh, it was also the day they played the Lakers. And so LeBron was asked about him. And he said that Dirk is the greatest international player of all time. It's a big statement, Eddie, considering. Um, do you agree? I think there's some uh, names. Do we count Duncan? I know there's always a debate about counting Duncan. No. I don't think we count Duncan. No, but I, for USA. We, we, yeah, because yeah, he's, he's U.S. Virgin Islands, not BVI. So he's okay. He's still American. But my about vote Hakeem is, my, my vote is Hakeem. And I, yeah. I, think, I, I think this is like a little bit of a Freudian slip. When you say foreign guys, you mean like white foreign guys. Because <laughs> then he said Manu, and he didn't mention Hakeem at all. And I know he has respect for Hakeem. He's paid right. Hakeem cold hard cash to teach him how to play basketball a little bit better. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, I, I think Hakeem, but Dirk is right there. I mean, Dirk is a legend in his own right, an icon, uh, he, 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 historic guy. Uh, the I believe he's the only foreign player to score thirty thousand points, which th- that in and of of itself is worthy yeah. of, of that praise. So he's up there. He has a, he has his argument. I go Hakeem, but yeah. Dirk isn't too far off. I, I get what Brown's going for. Maybe I mean, he, he served Brown European. his worst loss ever. He, I think that's what he means. He that's, served I Brown his worst loss ever. Mm-hmm. He's got to he's got to build him up a little bit to to make himself uh, uh, come out of that a little bit better. But even if he well, meant European, where where is Manu Ginobili from? Argentina. <laughs> he's, so he's Latin yeah, American. So, oh yeah, you're right. Oh, so okay. Then so, there's Tony Parker, which I'm just biased. Um, 
But Tony I also Parker's mocked. He Stop also it. mocked Dirk. Nev you better watch yourself. Yes, he is. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but he also mocked Dirk Nowitzki and then suffered a, an embarrassing finals loss. Right. So I feel like there's an added element of you know putting Dirk up makes it even seem like yeah. a lesser. No, I, I don't know. If anybody benefits from propping Dirk up, right? And anybody out there respects Dirk, it's gonna be LeBron. Yeah. So. So, yeah. but I'm going Dirk to Hakeem. and Hakeem out, are like no brainers. Those two are no brainers to me. But what about Giannis and Nikola Jokic? I mean, I, is yeah. it too early to be talking about those two guys nope. vying to be the best international player ever? Like, I think they both have a shot, especially Nikola Jokic goes uh, three consecutive MVP awards. Oh, yeah. And Giannis to me is on another type of a, a level as well. Obviously, I don't, he, he's only won a couple MVPs. Um, defensive player of the year awards. Uh, I mean, he's going to go down as an all time great, too. Champion, just like the way Dirk won it, Giannis won it. He just won it earlier. Um, but I, I think both of those guys have the ability to surpass Dirk and or Hakeem as well. I think, no, I I think, think you're right. When it's all said and done, I think they will be. Of course, LeBron's not going to say that now. Uh, he's also a prisoner of the moment. You're in Dallas being asked about Dirk Nowitzki the day statues revealed. You're like, ah, great. But yeah, I think those guys will definitely be, they're getting statues, right? Like there's going to be a Jokic statue in Denver. Giannis is, a, I mean, they're both a great point. And Giannis is only 28 years old. Kind of easy to forget with his prolific and his kind of omnipresent as he's been the last decade <laughs> Look of basketball. Look at his resume. 28 <laughs> years crazy. old. Six, yeah. six all NBAs. He's won a title. He's got two MVPs. Uh, did the MVP defensive player of the year thing. He's got a final. You're right. He, he's on that trajectory. He's on like a top 10 trajectory. So he can absolutely be the best international player ever. Uh, you know, not, not just the European ones. Uh, like, like, like LeBron <laughs> said. <laughs> now I want to do the greatest international squad versus the greatest American squad of all time. Put it together and see what we have. Okay, we'll work on that in the break. Uh, I'm sure we'll have it for you when we get back. Uh, when, when we come back, DeMar DeRozan, clutch player, most clutch player. Mm, I don't know. That's all happening when Run It Back returns. Run it up, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up. Welcome back to Run It Back, little you buying that time, Eddie. You ready? I just I'm ready. This. All right, let's is do this. Is Shams ready? Is Shams ready is the better? Yeah, I'm, that's a good question. I'm buying anything that Michelle's selling, so Shoot. Michelle can sell me anything. I, well, first of all, I'm just going to be full dis full disclosure. I'm not even selling this first one, but let's do it anyway. It's <laughs> Mellow Ball. Doing great. Okay, top 10 in assists and threes per game. But, Eddie, are you buying that the Hornets could win a championship with ball. Who's on the team? Is, 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 is KD and Giannis matter? on the team too? Is Steph <laughs> on the team too? Like, who do we, uh, is he the best it. player on the team? Because I, I'm not buying that. I watched them play last night and I love LaMelo Ball. I love the yeah. Ball family. I've interviewed their pops. I, I think, you know, he, he's, he's a great story. He watched the ball roll up the court for about 15 seconds, down eight. And he did the whole clock thing the wrong way. And it was just like, I guess it looks cool, but what are you doing? I, and it just bothered me to know. And that they, uh, Steve Clifford just went off on them like a week ago saying they're not playing winning basketball. They're not trying, they're not playing defense. They're just playing selfishly. And when you watch them, they are. And he's a part of the problem. A incredibly skilled player put on a show in Sacramento, put on a show last night, but put on a losing show. So I don't know if he can lead the Hornets to the title. He can be part of a title team at some point, but I'm not buying him being the guy on the championship team. Sorry. Do we think, like, how hands-on is Michael Jordan? Like, don't we think you'd like to see a team associated with Michael Jordan fundamentally be better? Just better, right? Like, I, I don't know. I, 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 they've been, I wish it's... They've been ravaged this year, though. Like, I, it's, it's hard for yeah. me to judge this Hornets. It's, it's, it's like this year's a wash. I mean, Miles Bridges was their leading scorer last year. They depended a lot on him. He was set to get the hundred million dollar plus bag, and then he has the the the, the domestic violence violence case um, yep. that he was that, that he did a, a couple of days before free agency. Like it, it's been an awful storm for the Hornets this year. Everyone in and out of the lineup. So it's tough for me to judge this version of the team, but it's clear, like Eddie said, uh, who's on this team if Lamelo's mm -hmm. leading it to a title? Like you got to have a stack. Fair question. Like, you got to have a good group here. 
Yeah, it can't just be him. All right, Kyle Kuzma time, averaging career high in points a game this season. Are you buying that he could be the missing piece that makes a team a contender, Eddie? Yeah, I, I think the the Milwaukee Bucks can absolutely use him right now. I think the Phoenix Suns could use it. I think the Brooklyn Nets. All the teams that we view as contenders would be much better if they got Kyle Kuzma, especially if they didn't have to give up much. He only makes $13 million a year. Uh, so it's not going to take much in the way of a trade. You, you probably have to add some draft capital uh, and then you're going to deal with him this summer as you try to retain him. But uh, a, a guy at this size who can defend a little bit, who can shoot, he can grab the dribble. He makes every contender better. I think somebody's going to get him hopefully. And he's going to, he's going to shift one of these conferences. It's crazy as it sounds. I mean, this guy was the ninth man on a title uh, team two, two years ago. Uh, but but he's improved that much, and he is that good, I believe. And, and with the right group that will kind of slot him in the right spot and settle him a little bit because he only plays in one speed and sometimes he's a little out of control, he can absolutely transform one of these contenders. Yeah, Shams, are those trade talks heating up at all? No, I, I really think the Wizards are waiting and seeing how this team develops over the course of this month, coming up in January. Like, we saw what the Wizards did last year, right? They moved... Spencer Dinwiddie, um, Montrez Harrell, a few guys at the, right at the deadline. Uh, they wanted to see that team uh, figure it out. I think similarly this year, Bradley Beal missed some time with a hamstring injury. You want to see how Chris Porzingis, Kuzma, and, and Beal continue to play with each other going into February. If they don't turn it around, then I, I think given Kuzma's status, he's got a player option for next year. There are teams interested, Phoenix, Atlanta, um, he's going to have a marketplace for sure. You know, d- does a John Collins for Kuzma deal make sense sometime in, in February if, if John Collins starts to play a little bit better and Kuzma's continuing to play the way he's playing? I think the Wizards are going to keep an open mind, but right now, the way Kuz is playing, you want to see this through. DeMar DeRozan, right now, leading the NBA in clutch shooting, Eddie. You buying him as most clutch in the league. Well, this is his year to actually get awarded for that. If so, um, he's up there. Uh, we've, we've seen him just knock down a game winner the other day. He takes that role. Uh, ser- he takes it on his shoulders, and he, he seems to come through more often than not. So, yeah, I'm buying it. I, I think this year is kind of – we haven't seen as much of this. I, I know we had the Shea game winner. We've had a few others. We had a Josh Hart game winner. Uh, but yeah, I, I'll buy this one. We haven't seen too oh. much prolific stuff from the LeBrons of the world. Steph has been out. I, I'll go with Demar. I like that one. Chicago, kind of all over the place. They had a little win streak um, before last night. Shams, is there a chance that that team's going to shake things up? I mean, that that's what the entire league is kind of honing in on. I think even more particularly the Zach Levine question is what a host of teams are keeping their eye on. Does he become available on the trade market? Because, uh, you know, him, as I reported last week, him and the Bulls just have not been seeing eye to eye throughout the course of the last several weeks. And I think this is an issue that the Bulls got through last week. They went 3-0 and after uh, everything that happened on Tuesday. They had a, even on Sunday, it was, last Sunday when they lost 150, I think to 126, uh, they had a shouting match in the locker room area. That got out there. Players spoke about it. The coach spoke uh, spoke about it. That's not a good place to be in, speaking about internal strife. And then we know about the disconnects and, and the different issues that exist. So this is a team that has issues. They bounced back convincingly last week. And then they have a dud last night against Houston. Uh, we'll see. Again, they're another team that's going to try to, um, you know, see what they have going into February before they make any decisions. Vultures are circling on that roster. Uh, right? Alex that Caruso, bo- Zach Levine, Ooh. Vucevic. A lot of guys on that team that will do well on other teams. So we'll see. I mean, I, I think they're right to wait it out. But a lot of teams are going to be ready for the fire sale if, if they start it. By the way, when Eddie references vultures, um, he's talking about himself because he's constantly shopping rosters to see how to make the nets better. That is going to do it for us on this fine Tuesday morning. We will be back tomorrow bright and early, 10 Eastern, as we always are, Mondays through Wednesdays. For then, Shams, Eddie, see you all tomorrow.